Hey, thanks everyone, and thanks to NCCN, and thank you, Francis. I think um, um, sort of powerful words, right, and powerful uh, experience. So I am going to talk about um, planning treatment first, and then we'll get into sort of specific treatments and focus a little bit, um, because of limits in time, on what's happened or what's changed in the last five years. So <clears throat> I always will tell my patients the first time I meet them, there's really three questions to address. What's the nature of the cancer? And the three sort of sub-questions, what type, the molecular characteristics in pd one all of which I'll try to explain later. What's the extent of the cancer, namely what stage, both by x-rays, radiographs, as well as by patho pathologic staging? And then what else is going on? Mainly here, we're thinking about the functional status of the patient. Um, you know, have, have you lost a lot of weight or, you know, still working full time? Uh, and other chronic medical conditions as well. How do we address these? Well, you, you know, as an old-fashioned physician, the first thing is history and physical exam. Um, Hippocrates and Osler, you know, sort of taught us how to do that. We ask about smoking, about weight loss, and about self-care. Are you able to bathe yourself, for example, or does someone need to help you with that? We think about doing imaging if it hasn't already been done, including CT scans, MRI of the brain, and PET scan. The, the only update that I'll comment about, I'm not a, a radiologist, but is that digitization of these images is, is ongoing um, pretty much everywhere now. And then the, the new thing is these um, um, AI-type programs and, and radiomics, you know, trying to make, have the computer make sense of it even before we see it. So the next thing is, so history and physical, imaging, next thing is biopsy bunch of different techniques. I'm, I'm not going to talk really about uh, surgical techniques, but there's a lot of different um, sort of minimally invasive surgical uh, procedures. Uh, somehow we just need to get a, a piece of the tissue to figure out what exactly it is. I'll talk a little bit at, later on about the, the so-called liquid biopsy. And then uh, pathology. That, the pathologists are the guys that are in the end gals that are you know, uh, look under the microscope at the tissue and decide what is this cancer and uh, what are the molecular characteristics of it. So, so let's jump into pathology. There's sort of three levels of analyses, all three of which are part of this precision medicine paradigm. First is histology. Basically, what does it look like? Um, there's two broad characteristics called small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. And then within that broad umbrella term of non-small cell lung cancer, there's three subtypes, three common subtypes, squamous, adenocarcinoma, and large cell cancers, and then sometimes mixtures of those. Next step is we do immunohistochemistry, or IHC, which are when your doctor says, well, we did some special stains to determine what kind of cancer it is. And in particular, that's useful for the analysis of a, of a protein called PDL1 which is important when we think about doing immunotherapy. And then finally, there is the molecular analysis, and that's when we do the genes that are involved with the cancer. Uh, I always call them the gas pedals. What make this cancer grow? <clears throat> so what's new, um, digital pathology has, has, has started to take um, effect. It's, it's common, I think, in most academic centers. I think it's just starting to trickle into the more community hospitals. Um, and it really doesn't change the interpretation. However, it'll, um, I think this is going to be a, a great boon in terms of sharing and getting second opinions um, across the country, across the world, you know, with the experts, um, um, thoracic pathologists, for example. In IHC, really, uh, the, the one that's really made the impact, as I alluded to already, is PDL1. And that's most important for talking about the therapeutic implications, namely for immunotherapy. There's sort of three classes of PDL1, either that it's zero, there's no staining, that there's intermediate, 1 to 49%, or that there's high, greater than 50% staining. We'll talk about treatment in um, the next section. Molecular analysis, this is uh, stuff that I um, sort of lived through. Um, so the Human Genome Project, for those of you um, who remember, was established in 1990. It's now transitioned into the um, NHGRI, or National Human Genome Research Institute. Thirteen years after being founded, uh, in 2003, they announced the complete sequencing of the fir very first human genome, consisting of th over 3 billion base pairs, about 22,000 genes, 20 contributing institutions, one genome, uh, more than a billion dollars. 
so, so things have changed in the last 16 years. Now these analyses are routinely done in about a month at a cost of about $1,000. Uh, and, and that change in, in the cost and the speed of these analyses have truly transformed medicine. Uh, and first amongst these, I would argue, is cancer. And lung cancer is, is in some ways leading the way in terms of the molecular analyses. Now, just to be clear, I don't routinely order a, a whole genome sequencing. We typically do an analysis of 50 to 500 cancer-relevant genes. So these cancer-relevant genes, like I said, there's sort of three uh, broad, broadly speaking, three classes I think about. One are the oncogenes, the gas pedals, which promote growth. One are the breaks, the tumor suppressor genes. And then the third sort of ill-defined class are involved in DNA repair, immune activation, uh, cancer stem cells, for example. Sequencing looks for errors in the DNA code, which lead these oncogenes to be turned on, the tumor suppressor genes to be turned off. Um, and then one clarification, this isn't genetic in the, in the same uh, way you think about you know, the breast cancer inherited gene syndrome. So it's mostly, uh, primarily we're looking at the, what, what are referred to as somatic gene alterations, namely uh, alterations, mutations that occur only within the cancer itself, not within um, the germline. Though sometimes uh, we will refer a patient to a, to a cancer genetics expert because of something we see on the analysis or because of, for example, young age or, or other characteristics. Two other things that have, have come out in just the last couple of years, sort of updates, like, like we said. One is this, this phenomenon called tumor mutation burden, and this is a technique where they actually count the number of mutations in a given stretch of DNA. Lung cancer tends to have a, a high TMB compared to other tumors like leukemia or childhood tumors, and in some studies, this seems to be predictive of response to immunotherapy drugs for complicated reasons that I won't get into. Microsatellite instability is another particular form of mutation that, that sort of causes a hypermutation, if you will, that, that alterations in these genes cause uh, excessive mutations, again, that may uh, predict for responsiveness to, to immunotherapy drugs. Not that common in lung cancer, but it is often looked at. Finally, let's uh, talk about liquid biopsy. So that's where we do molecular analysis from a couple of tubes of blood so-called cell-free DNA. Um, we, we don't actually analyze circulating tumor cells, but analyze the shed DNA from the tumors into the, into the bloodstream. Um, and this allows us to, to search uh, the DNA for mutations. It's mostly used to, to analyze for resistance to targeted therapies. Um, and I saw that there were some questions already ab about these. We'll, we'll need to get into that. Um, however, I think it's also potentially useful at the start of therapy, particularly if the tissue biopsy is insufficient or you don't have it available. Um, and, and at times, the main issue is showing an alteration within these uh, cancer-promoting genes. 